second is that they attribute a very high status to the teaching profession. They recognize that you can't improve education if you don't pick great people to teach and if you don't keep giving them constant support and professional development. Investing in professional development is not a cost, it's an investment. And every other country that's succeeding well knows that, whether it's Australia, Canada, uh, South Korea, Singapore, Hong Kong, or Shanghai. They know that to be the case. And the third is, they devolve responsibility to the school level for getting the job done. You see, there's a big difference here between going into a mode of command and control in education. That's what happens in some systems. You know, central governments decide or state governments decide they know best and they're going to tell you what to do. The trouble is that education doesn't go on in the committee rooms of our legislative buildings. It happens in classrooms and schools. And the people who do it are the teachers and the students. And if you remove their discretion, it stops working. You have to put it back to the people. There is wonderful work happening in this country. Uh, but I have to say, it's happening in spite of the dominant culture of education, not because of it. It's like people are sailing into a headwind all the time. And the, the reason I think is this, that many of the current policies are based on mechanistic conceptions of education. It's like education is an industrial process that can be improved just by having better data. And somewhere in, I think, the back of the mind of some policymakers is this idea that if we fine tune it well enough, if we just get it right, it'll all hum along perfectly into the future. It won't, and it never did. The point is that education is not a mechanical system, it's a human system. It's about people. People who either do want to learn or don't want to learn. Every student who drops out of school has a reason for it, which is rooted in their own biography. They may find it boring, they may find it irrelevant, uh, they may find that it's at odds with the life they're living outside of school. There are trends, but the stories are always unique. I was at a meeting recently in Los Angeles of, they're called alternative education programs. These are programs designed to get kids back into education. They have certain common features. They're very personalized. They have strong support for the teachers, close links with the community, and a broad and diverse curriculum, and often programs which involve students outside school as well as inside school. And they work. What's interesting to me is these are called alternative education. <laughs> you know? <laughs> and all the evidence from around the world is if we all, if we all did that, there'd be no need for the alternative. So I think we have to embrace a different metaphor. We have to recognize that it's a human system and there are conditions under which people thrive and conditions under which they don't. We are, after all, organic creatures. And the culture of the school is absolutely essential. Culture is an organic term, isn't it? Not far from where I live is a place called Death Valley. Death Valley is the hottest, driest place in America, and nothing grows there. Nothing grows there because it doesn't rain. Hence, Death Valley. In the winter of 2004, it rained in Death Valley. Seven inches of rain fell over a very short period. And in the spring of 2005, there was a phenomenon. The whole floor of Death Valley was carpeted in flowers for a while. What it proved is this, that Death Valley isn't dead. It's dormant. Right beneath the surface are these seeds of possibility, waiting for the right conditions to come about. And with organic systems, if the conditions are right, life is inevitable. It happens all the time. You take an area, a school, a district, you change the conditions, give people a different sense of possibility, a different set of expectations, a broader range of opportunities. You cherish and value the relationships between teachers and learners. You offer people the discretion to be creative and to innovate in what they do. And schools that were once bereft spring to life. Great leaders know that. 
The real role of leadership in education, and I think it's true at the national level, the state level, at the school level, is not and should not be command and control. The real role of leadership is climate control. Creating a climate of possibility. And if you do that, people will rise to it and achieve things that you completely did not anticipate and couldn't have expected. There's a wonderful quote from Benjamin Franklin. There are three sorts of people in the world. Those who are immovable, people who don't get it, they don't want to get it, they're not going to do anything about it. There are people who are movable, people who see the need for change and are, are prepared to listen to it. And there are people who move, people who make things happen. And if we can encourage more people, that will be a movement. And if the movement is strong enough, that's, in the best sense of the word, a revolution. And that's what we need. Thank you very much. <laughs>